James and I'm Filipino and the other Filipinos in the house make some noise. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay, all right, that's enough before the white people ask us for medical advice. All right, let's <laughs> keep it down. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. I, uh, I'm, I'm from Manila. That's actually where my family's from, but I grew up here in New Zealand. I grew up here in New Zealand in a very Filipino household, which means I grew up in a really religious household, right? And my favorite thing about growing up in a religious household was uh, learning that God has a sense of humor. He loves jokes, right? But sometimes those jokes, a little mean, can, can get a little mean, I gotta say. And I think the meanest thing that God ever did was make all Filipinos love basketball and then make us all five foot one. <laughs> like, like, that's so fucking mean, bro. Like, gee, thanks, God. I can't wait to play 1v1 basketball with someone, and when I defend them, my face comes up to their dick. Thank you. <laughs> like, why would you make a group of people love something and take away the one thing that would give them an advantage at that activity? You know, that's like if God made all New Zealanders love rugby, but then didn't make any Polynesian people. <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, I'm not saying all Polynesian people are good at rugby. No, I'm saying without them, we'd be fucking trash. <laughs> There's a difference, right? You know what's wild about that is I'm pretty tall for a Filipino guy, right? But I'm trash at basketball. <laughs> it's such a waste, bro. I'm, I'm, it's such a fucking waste. My, my entire life growing up, all my, uh, my Filipino uncles, my titos, uh, would just come up to me and be like, oh, wow, so tall, wow, basketball player, basketball player, right? And then they see me shoot a basketball and I miss the entire rim completely and they're like, oh, never mind, <laughs> graphic designer. You know, like it's, it's disappointing, you know. But I, uh, I grew up here in New Zealand looking like this. And can I be honest with you guys just for a second? I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. Sometimes growing up looking like this in New Zealand, not always that easy, you know? And I feel like in 2023, the hardest thing about looking like this in New Zealand is posting videos on the internet and experiencing racism, right? Like, so what will happen often is I'll post a video of my stand-up and then someone will comment some wild ass shit in the comments, some racist shit, right? And I'll try to click on that person's profile to see who said it to me, but often their profile said to private, right? So all I have to go off is a little round profile photo, right? And I've noticed something about this, and it's that most of the time the racist abuse doesn't come from women. Shit, most of the time the racist abuse doesn't come from men. Most of the time the racist abuse comes from cars. <laughs> Yo, cars are the most racist users of the fucking internet. The amount of times I've been told to go back to where I came from by a Nissan Skyline. <laughs> Which is rich coming from a car imported from Japan. <laughs> like, do you know how it feels to be called a chink by a Mitsubishi? <laughs> Not good. <laughs> it's always cars, bro, always cars. And I hate it, it's ruined so many things for me in my life, you know? Can't do certain things anymore. Can't walk through a car park without feeling unsafe. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just like, I hate crimes about to go down. <laughs> I like the way that Mercedes is looking at me. <laughs> can't, uh, can't watch certain movies anymore. You know, Disney's Cars, can't watch that. <laughs> I get about 10 minutes in, I'm like, mm, these cars wanted to make America great again. Like, it's, you know, Whitening McQueen. Okay, like, it's really... <laughs> welcome, welcome to my show, though. Welcome to my show. Uh, it's called Badong, right? It's called Badong. Now, everyone's always like, why Badong? What does Badong mean? So Badong is actually my very traditional Filipino nickname that was given to me as a child, right? Now, this is a very Filipino thing to have a name like this. So you have your real name, and then your parents will give you this other Filipino name that has nothing to do with that name, right? And look, I know, I know like white people have nicknames too, you know, like Steve or whatever, but like... <laughs> But Filipinos take that shit to the next level, right? Because I swear no one in the community will call you by your real name. It's always just your Filipino name. You know, like one of my friends growing up, uh, his name is Von, we call him Jing Jong, right? My little sister, her name's Gisela, we call her Klang Klang, right? <laughs> my name's James, I got Badong, right? <laughs> Every Filipino person in my life is in witness protection, just trying to hide, okay? Now. I know there's a lot of Filipinos in here, which I'm so beautiful. Look, look at all your beautiful Filipino faces, right? I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna give you the count of three, and I want you to give me a clap if you have a name like this too. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. <laughs> 
Do you know what that was? It's three people going, I do, and then everyone going, fuck that, I'm not clapping. <laughs> I don't want him to know my name's Dong Dong or some shit like that. <laughs> Those three people, fuck yeah, I'm proud of you. I love you. Who you, you clap, man, did you clap? You've got one? Yeah. Beautiful, what's, what's your real name? Adrian. Adrian, beautiful name. And is your Filipino name quite different to your? Kind of. Kind of? Okay, what's your Filipino name? Benini. Benini, that's so different, Adrian. <laughs> Kind of. That doesn't even share the same letters. <laughs> Adrian the Benini. Benini is a beautiful name. That's a, that's a gorgeous name. Do you know what it means? Uh, I think it's something to do about how I like, was posed when I was born. Oh, how you pose when you're born. Yeah. You mean you you came out pose? You came out like out the womb? Like... <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> Benini. Who else? Who else clapped over here? Someone else clapped. Some. Who else? Who else? Everyone's like disappearing to the shadows. <laughs> I don't want to become Benini. <laughs> that's all right. Well, that's all good, man. I'm, 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 I'll tell you about my name then. So for those of you wondering what Badong means, in my language, Tagalog, Badong means the sound of Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone needs any help. I, uh, I actually asked my dad, I asked my dad, I was like, why Badong? Where did you get Badong from? And he goes, because when you were born, there was a popular movie and there was a character named Badong. And I was like, and? And he's like, the end. <laughs> I was like, fucking what? That's it? No other reason, just a popular character? That's wild ads. That's like if I had a kid now and I was like, hey everybody, this is my son, Dr. Strange. <laughs> this is his older sister, Shrek. <laughs> and this little baby's the hot guy from Bridgerton. <laughs> But we call her Badong. <laughs> I, I actually found the movie, dude. I found the movie that my family named me after. And it was a movie from the Philippines in 1991 titled Alias Dodong Guapo. Right, this movie right here, right? A couple of people seen it before, that's beautiful. So in this movie, the main character's name is Dodong. Now apparently Dodong was the original name for the inspiration for my name, right? And Dodong morphed and changed into Badong, right? Kind of like a Puff Daddy Diddy situation, you know, just kind of, <laughs> kind of morphed. Now for those of you who don't know, this translates roughly to alias Dodong Handsome, right? And in this movie, the main character Dodong is played by a Filipino actor named Gestoni Alarcon, right? Looks like that. Yeah, that's the right reaction to Gestoni Alarcon. <laughs> Because this kid was the hot of his, of his generation. This guy was like the Pinoy Timothy Chalamet, you know what I mean? And if you're still not on board with Justoni, um, okay, well that's fine. Have a look at this picture, right? <laughs> well, do you know how hot you have to be to pull off working out in jeans? <laughs> like if I tried to do this, everyone at the gym would be like, that guy's depressed. <laughs> But he's doing it, you know? That's my inspiration. If I could ever work out in jeans, I know I've made it, right? <laughs> so when I learned this, I was like, man, that's so cool. Dodong Guapo, handsome, named me after this guy. It's like my parents saw me as a little baby and went, this kid's gonna grow up to be a hot boy. <laughs> he's gonna be a hot boy. Give him a hot boy name, Badong, Guap, hot boy, you know? <laughs> and it felt fucking awesome. It felt really good. It made me feel good, you know? And I found the movie and I watched the movie. And uh, nope, turns out I was wrong, because in the movie, he looks like this. <laughs> My parents saw that and went, that's our boy. <laughs> now, I'm not here to body shame Dodon Guapo or to make fun of this movie. No, I love this movie, right? And that, like, but let me explain to you the plot of this movie and then maybe you understand why it was a weird choice to choose this movie to name me after, right? So this movie is about this guy, his name is Dodong. He looked like this and he lived in a town where everyone was just mean to him. So mean, they said the wildest shit right to his face. They said stuff like this. Hey Dodong, where are you going? Can you go? Let's go to my son and let me go to the house. Okay, go. Bye. Ikaw bang bagong tagahugas? Oo. Bastos ka! Pag inakaus ka, humarap ka! Kasi o, ang bilin sa akin ni boss eh... Humarap ka sa amin! That's so fucking mean, bro! Right to his face! And the whole first half of the movie is like this. Everyone's just like, fuck you, Dodong, you ugly piece of shit. 
And when I saw this, I went, okay, well then surely the second half of the movie is gonna be about Dodong and the rest of the town learning that beauty is more than skin deep. You know, that there's more to things in life than just looks and aesthetics. Maybe everyone will learn something, right? And I watched the second half of the movie, and uh, nope, turns out I was wrong again, because the second half is about Dodong getting in some trouble with some gangsters, <laughs> stealing a whole bunch of money from them, and then using that money to get plastic surgery on his face <laughs> so he can become a hot boy action star. And the first thing he does after he gets the surgery is he has sex with a girl that wouldn't have sex with him earlier in the movie. And then the movie just ends. <laughs> And that's the guy my family chose to name me after. <laughs> my favorite part about the second half of the movie is actually the scene where Dodong got his plastic surgery done, because I reckon it's the most realistic depiction of a medical procedure ever committed to film. Doc, gano ba katagal ang operasyon? Well, uh, there will be a series of operations. Bawat operasyon ay matatapos na isang buong araw. After one week, alisin, may bago ka ng muka. First of all, how relaxed is this hospital that the family's allowed to watch the operation? <laughs> like, you should not be there, bro. Especially the little kid. What are you doing? Do you know how I know? Because look at this fucking kid. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna be in therapy for years, man. <laughs> so anyway, that goes on for another couple minutes and then it fades to black and then it goes one week later and then this happens. What a dick. <laughs> yeah, you're handsome now. You look like shit before. <laughs> but for the first time I saw that, I had so many questions. So many questions, right? First question, how is his moustache still intact? <laughs> Did they cut around it? <laughs> it just grew back miraculously? Second question, why this guy? Why did my dad choose this guy to name me after out of all the people, right? And for ages, like, I couldn't figure it out. I was like, what, what's going on, you know? And, uh, and then I saw this photo of my dad, and I was like, oh, he's projecting, okay. Uh, that's cool. He's trying to manifest some shit. So that's the guy, man. That's the guy that I was named after. I've actually been thinking a lot about the name Badong recently, right? Because the name Dodong in Visaya, in Visaya in the Philippines, it actually means little boy, right? That's what it means. And that makes absolute sense, you know? Because when I think about the name Badong or Dodong, in my head, what I imagine is this. Right? A cute little kid like that. But by the way, that's me. If you ever... <laughs> like, I didn't just go on Google and go Asian kid. Like, it wasn't... <laughs> right, that's me at the age of four rocking a haircut that says, this was done at home, right? <laughs> Looking cute, right? So I went, okay, well, if that's Badong, is this still Badong? Like, have I outgrown the name Badong? Is it time to retire the name Badong, right? And I think to answer that question, I had to reflect back on my whole life, right? Because how I feel about this name Badong has, has shifted dramatically over the years, right? And I think those changes can be broken down to the three distinct sections of my life. The first section is the early years, right? Because when I was a little kid, I fucking hated the name Badong so much. I hated it, you know? And I think that hatred started when I moved to New Zealand and I became a migrant and I experienced all the challenges that migrants face when you move here, especially as a kid, right? And those challenges are the three L's, right? The three L's. And they are language, labels, and lunch, right? Those three. <laughs> I feel like we know what lunch is. <laughs> let's put a pin in that and circle back to it, right? So let's break them down, shall we? The first challenge is language. Now, this is self-explanatory. When you arrive in a new country, you have to learn the language that everyone speaks in that country in order to, to get by in the world, right? And in New Zealand, that language is English. Now, English is a fucking hard language to learn, dude. I don't know if you've realized, English speakers, I don't know if you've realized this, but we walk around speaking in riddles all day. <laughs> Nothing makes any fucking sense, dude. And if you don't believe me, right, imagine you're a migrant, right? You've just moved to New Zealand, you barely know any English, right? And someone of your work comes up to you the first day at work and goes, now I'm not pulling your leg, right? But I heard through the grapevine that Helen was just gonna bite the bullet and let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> I 
you just be like, what the fuck are you saying? <laughs> and even if you're like, sorry, I don't quite understand, they just be like, neither do I. <laughs> but you know, Helen always counts her chickens before they hatch. <laughs> like, say what you mean, you fucking Batman villain. <laughs> so confusing, right? So that's, that's the first L, language. The second L is labels. And by labels, I mean when you arrive in your new country, everyone's gonna give you a label and that's how everyone in that country is gonna see you moving forward, right? For example, a label that I was given when I migrated here was Asian, right? Back in the Philippines, I wasn't an Asian. I was just me, I was James, you know? And then I moved to New Zealand and I became an Asian, right? But by the way, only by label, right? Like I, I didn't, like I've always been physiologically Asian, you know, like, like I didn't transform on the plane when I landed. <laughs> like I wasn't sitting on the plane like, lads, I'm so hungry, yeah, man, I'm so hungry, lads. I don't see smash a whole plate of <laughs> rice. Like it wasn't like that. <laughs> I just landed here, they gave me the label, bang, Asian. And I had to learn that wearing that label meant that people would look at me a certain type of way moving forward, you know? Now the third L, is lunch. Now, a couple of giggles in the room. I feel like everyone knows what this is. Because I feel like every ethnic or multicultural person has a story about bringing ethnic food to school or to work, and everyone looking at you a bit funny because no one knows what that food is, right? At least back in the day. Maybe not as much in 2023, because I feel like we've normalized ethnic food. You know, to the point that actually in 2023, I wouldn't be surprised if the kids that had the most ethnic food at school were the white kids. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Everyone's just like, oh, Jaden, what's that? And he's like, oh, this? It's just some tabbouleh sushi from my mom's favorite Israeli-Asian fusion restaurant. <laughs> yeah, the place is called Walk on Water. Like, it's real good. <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised if that's happening now, you know? But back then, it wasn't like that. It wasn't. I had my own lunch story. I'll share it with you now, okay? So this happened to me in the first week of primary school in year four, Glenfield Primary, right? My mom sent me to school with an ice cream container full of adobo and rice. Right? <laughs> Classic Filipino dish, right? And this was at primary school, so there wasn't a microwave there, so that shit was ice cold, right? Like, you know when the fat solidifies on top of it? <laughs> yeah, it was wild, bro. So I sit down and I open the container and this kid in my class sits down next to me, looks into the container and goes, ooh, yuck, right? And then runs away, joins his friends laughing, eating his Nutella sandwich, right? <laughs> now that night I go back home and I go to my mom, I go, mom, can you please not pack me any more Filipino food, please? Can I just have sandwiches now? Thanks. And it breaks her heart, but she does it, right? So for the rest of school, primary, intermediate, high school, no more Filipino food, just Nutella sandwiches, right? And looking back on that as an adult now, that fucking breaks my heart so much, it does. Because the reason my mom wanted to give me the Filipino food was because she loved me, right? And she wanted to show her affection for me and that she cared about me, you know? Like, like meanwhile, all these other fucking kids have their moms at home being like, bread, Nutella, bread, bang, now go to school so I can cheat on your dad. <laughs> I couldn't see that as a kid, you know? I couldn't, I was like blinded by trying to fit in, you know? And that's really what those three owls are all about, right? It's just trying to fit in, right? And I think that's why I hated the name Badong, right? Because Badong made me stand out, you know, at school. So what I did was I hid it away, right? And what happened was I became James at school, but Badong at home. Right, and if that line ever got blurred, I would freak the fuck out. It would be the worst day of my life, right? And all three of my sisters knew that shit. So they used it as a weapon, right? <laughs> Honestly, every one of them, every time I had like a white friend over from school, like every single one of my siblings would just come into the room and be like, hi, Badong, right? <laughs> just come in the room, Badong, dinner's ready, Badong, Badong, Badong. Like, <laughs> and all my white friends would be like, why do they keep calling you Badong? And then I have to make up some bullshit, like, <laughs> yeah, in my language, it means your highness. Um, <laughs> Bullshit, you know? My whole family did that shit to me, dude. Even, even my parents, you know? Because my, my parents are so funny, dude. This, they're so fucking funny, both of them. My dad, my dad is so funny. Uh, my favorite thing about my dad is um, how he uses his Amazon Alexa, right? It's so good. You guys know what Amazon Alexa is, that little machine you ask it for recipes, music, right? So how he uses it is he goes right up to the machine and he goes, psst, Alexa, <laughs> play me some music. <laughs> And I'm just like, why are you whispering secrets into the machine? <laughs> I almost just expect to walk in one day and just see him go, Psst, Alexa, did you know I killed a man in 1995? <laughs> Alexa's like, calling the police. <laughs> 
That's my dad. Uh, my mom's great too. My mom's also so funny. My mom's awesome because I feel like she's such a classic Filipino mom, man. Like every gesture she has to make has to be the most over the top shit you've ever seen. Everything just has to be incredibly huge, right? I'll give you an example, right? So this happened to me in uh, 2013. My family and I were at my graduation. I just graduated my degree and I was wearing my robes and my regalia, right? And I had to get my photo taken. And I went up to the counter and I asked the lady how much the photos were gonna cost. And she goes, $80. And so I turned to my mom and I go, $80. And she goes, all right, come on, let's go. We don't need that. Right, and we leave. <laughs> and we leave. Like we didn't buy it and I was fine, right? Did I cry on the ride home? Maybe, but it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> Now, flash forward eight years later, right? It's 2020, we're both in lockdown. My mom lives in Melbourne at this point. I get a Facebook message from my mom, and she goes, hi James, I'm just wondering if you could help me out with a project that I'm working on. Um, I wanna make a collection of you on your sister's graduation photos in my office like that. Could you please send me your photo, right? And I was like, mom, we don't have the photo, remember? We didn't buy it. And she goes, no, we definitely bought it. What are you talking about? And I was like, no, we didn't buy it, remember? You said, and I quote, fucking rip off. <laughs> And she goes, oh yeah, I did say that. <laughs> Never mind, I have a plan. Now, this was my mom's plan, right? So my mom transferred me enough money so I could go to a costume shop, hire graduation regalia, hire a photographer, and reenact the entire ceremony in my driveway. <laughs> this was to explain to the photographer? <laughs> he just kept being like, so what's this for again, bro? I was like, uh, my new OnlyFans, okay, peace. <laughs> Do you know the kicker to the story? The original photo was gonna cost us $80. This cost me $250. <laughs> Worth every penny. <laughs> That's my mom, man. Now, I tell you guys these stories about my family because I wanna paint a clear picture of where I grew up, right? Because I feel like, I feel like that's where I spent most of my time being badong, right? So that's the first part of my life, the early years. The second part is my 20s. Now, if I could sum up my 20s in a short, succinct sentence, I'd probably describe it as um, experiencing wild shit at the hands of white people, right? Now, go, go with me on this. I feel like, <laughs> I, feel like I, said, I, just, I just saw all the white people go, get them, it's all right, good, right? okay? Go with me on this, thank you for your money, thank you. <laughs> Go with me on this. Let me tell you a story, and then I swear you'll be on my side by the end of it, right? Let me tell you guys about the wildest gig I've ever done. All right, so this happened to me again in 2013. Um, at the time, I just graduated from drama school, and I was doing a bit of work as an actor for this company that would hire out actors like me to go play characters at children's birthday parties and corporate events, right? And this company was run by this uh, white lady who looked after me, gave me gigs. She was really nice to me, right? One day, I get an email from my boss. And she goes, hi James, I just got an email from a client who's hosting an event, and they're looking for an actor to come and play the King of Malaysia. Are you interested? <laughs> Seems legit. <laughs> so I just replied, hi there. Uh, look, thank you so much for the offer. Like, I would do the gig, but I'm afraid I am Filipino. Cheers. And she just replies, hi James, just spoke to the client again and they said that's not an issue. <laughs> Are you still keen? Which is a polite way of saying, close enough. <laughs> All good's with us. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, right? I'm sitting there, I'm reading this email, and I'm, I'm just sitting there, I'm like, man, do I wanna do this gig? You know, it seems, it seems pretty demeaning to me. And it seems like disrespectful to Malaysian people. Like, I don't really wanna do it, right? And as I thought that, I took an instant noodle cake, broke it in half, put one half in the water to boil, and I saved the other half for dinner, and I just replied, I'm in. <laughs> I'm so broke, please send help. And she goes, great news, we'll have more info for you closer to the night, cheers. And that's all the information I got about the gig, which is so fucking wild, dude. Because I had so many questions, so many questions. First of all, who was the client? Right? And what event could they possibly be hosting that they need an actor to come and play the King of Malaysia? And I don't know, what event? What event would you need a King of Malaysia? So down here, what would you need a King of Malaysia for? Wedding. Wedding? Wedding. <laughs> yeah, my dad's not here. King of Malaysia would walk me down the aisle. 
that's kind of what I was thinking. I was worried, dude. I was worried that it would be like some weird thing, like some like a bachelorette party or something. <laughs> you know, like the maid of honor was like, Becky, we got you that stripper you wanted. <laughs> And Becky's like, ooh, is it a Prince Harry lookalike? And she's like, kinda. <laughs> How do you feel about Malaysia? <laughs> Eventually the night of the gig arrives, right? I drive to the venue. Now the venue was this house in a suburb in Auckland called Takapuna, right? Now Takapuna hosts, it's host to, uh, you know, a certain kind of person, right? <laughs> we know. <laughs> I drive up to the house and the house was like this massive mansion. Right, I get out of the car and I walk towards the door. I ring the doorbell and I'm greeted by this white lady with a massive smile on her face. She's like, hi there. And I just say, uh, hi, uh, I'm one of the actors. I'm here for the party. And she goes, ooh, fun. Right, and in my head I went, for you. <laughs> and she goes, right this way, right? And she leads me into the house and she leads me through like this massive house and we go room after room after room and every room we go through is just filled, of, like, filled with like so many wealthy looking people holding champagne and mingling, right? Now, I feel like I don't need to tell you the ethnicity of everyone at this party. <laughs> yeah. Especially because I just used the word mingling. <laughs> like you guys know, you know, you know what I mean? Like white people mingle, you know? Like, like brown people chill, you know? Asian people network, like it's fucking... <laughs> This is my son, he's an engineer. Go, talk to him. <laughs> so we go through, and she leads me into this, like, this giant bathroom made out of marble, right? And then when I get there, I see there's another actor in the bathroom. And the other actor is my friend Amanda, who also works for this company, right? Now, this is important to the story. Amanda is from Singapore, right? And as soon as I see Amanda, she goes, this is Amanda, she'll be playing the queen of Malaysia. <laughs> and I just went, fucking, of course she is. <laughs> Because why not go zero for two at this stage, you know? <laughs> really just double down. And I see Amanda, and Amanda sees me, and like we lock eyes, and without saying anything out loud, because the lady was still there, we just looked at each other and went, some Caucasian shit's about to go down. <laughs> just, <laughs> just blinked at like Morse code, just beep, 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 and she leaves, right? So me and Amanda are there, and as soon as she leaves, me and Amanda huddle up. We're like, Phew. all right, look, let's just get through this. It's probably gonna be a little bit rough, but you know what? I've got your back, you've got my back, we'll be fine, let's get through it, right? So we go through, we open the closet, and we see the costumes we had to wear that night, and I was like, this is not gonna be okay. <laughs> now, I feel like I could tell you guys and describe to you what the costumes look like, but I don't think I'd really do it justice. So here's a picture. Um, <laughs> that's me and my Singaporean friend Amanda dressed up as the king and queen of Malaysia. Now, if there's anyone from Malaysia here or watching at home, I just wanna say, I'm sorry. This was not my choice, right? White people made us do this, okay? Like, I don't wanna come and gig in Malaysia and then halfway through the show, there's just a red dot on my head, like, fucking. <laughs> sorry, okay? Let's break the photo down, shall we? Right, first of all, I don't know how culturally accurate these costumes were, but judging by the correspondence I'd had with the client at that point, I wouldn't be surprised if they just went to a costume shop, found two matching prom outfits, and went, do you guys have this but spicy? <laughs> um, I want this but beef rendang. Do you guys have that? <laughs> Second of all, uh, my favorite part about this photo is how over it Amanda looks. Uh, <laughs> just so sick of it, dude. <laughs> this is a true story, by the way. This is a true story. When I was making the show, I went up to Amanda. I was like, do you mind if I show the picture of you dressed up as this? You know? And she's like, no, I don't mind. And she's like, under one condition. I was like, what is it? She's like, you have to tell everyone I'm single. Um, so she's... Um, <laughs> If there's anyone here, she has the costume still. Um, <laughs> so, so me and Amanda dressed like that, sitting in the bathroom, right? And uh, we start going through the scripts, right? Now, here's where the mystery started to get unraveled, right? Because we finally understood what the event actually was that we were doing there. Now, apparently what happened was an old rich white couple that lived in this house used to live in Malaysia. 
right? And when they lived in Malaysia, they did something that warranted them earning some sort of title, kind of like a knighthood, right? Not quite, but similar, right? And apparently they got that title from Malaysian royalty in a ceremony in Malaysia. And so what they wanted to do was they wanted to reenact that ceremony here in New Zealand in front of all their wealthy friends. And so what do you do when you have that problem? Hire a Filipino and Singaporean actor to come play the king and queen of Malaysia. Yeah, yeah, you guys looked all shocked. Try fucking being there, okay? <laughs> Now, my first thought whenever I think about this memory as an adult is what kind of psychopath hires a costume just to reenact the ceremony? Just... <laughs> like, who would do that, you know? So, so I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there, I'm reading the script, right? And I saw that I had lines. I was like, oh shit, I've got lines. They're in English, thank God, right? Because I didn't know how to speak Malaysian, right? So I was like, okay, I've got lines. But then as I was reading it, I was like, oh, do they want me to do a voice? Like, I can't do a Malaysian accent properly, dude. I don't want to be disrespectful, right? And plus, like, I do this thing where I, if I want to do an impression of someone, but I don't quite know how to do that person's voice, for some reason, I default to a version of that person as if they were a rapper. You know, I, I, I don't want to go out there and be like, hey, yo, what's up? It's the king of Malaysia, squaw! Like, I don't want to... <laughs> So I was like, okay, just do a voice you do know how to do then, all right? So I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll just do a Filipino accent. Don't even know the difference, right? <laughs> and, um, and so I did, I did that. I did a Filipino accent. And the character I ended up creating was my Filipino father if he became the king of Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> just go to your room or I'll send you to exile. <laughs> Alexa, call the president. <laughs> I'm sitting there, right? Eventually the lady comes back and she's like, we're ready for you. And I was like, okay. So me and Amanda look at each other and we go, right? We follow her down this long hall in front of these massive double doors, right? We're standing there, we're waiting. And she goes, when these doors open, you're on. I was like, okay. So I'm warming up, I'm like, right? Like, you know, all the things you do as an actor and something else you do as an actor is you think of your character's backstory, right? Before you go on stage, I was like, what's your character's backstory? So my character's backstory was, Broke actor disassociating so he can forget this memory. Right? <laughs> Got it the first go, right? Eventually the door opens, right? I'm standing there, look at Amanda, I take her arm, we take a breath, and we step through. Now, as soon as we step through, I see it's a massive room, it's a two-story room with a giant chandelier and a huge staircase going down to the ground floor, right? And I look out and it's just hundreds of minglers, right? Just. <laughs> Like, it looked like the Asian version of the movie Get Out, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? So me and, me and Amanda, arm in, arm in arm, like, are, like, kind of sifting through all the people and shuffling through them to find our mark, right? And as we're, like, going through everybody, I can just hear everyone in the crowd looking at us going, Ooh. Oh, look, look. Oh, wow. And I was just like, yo, do these people think I'm the actual king of Malaysia? <laughs> Like, how fucking dumb are these people, right? I looked this up and apparently when this happened, the real king of Malaysia was 85 years old. <laughs> so my acting range is 21 to 85. <laughs> Eventually me and Amanda find the mark, right? So on top of the stairs, hit our mark, right? Look down the stairs and at the bottom of the stairs, I see the old rich white couple, right, waiting. And we make eye contact, they nod, I nod and smile and they start ascending up the stairs. Now, as they're ascending up the stairs, all their friends are like flanking the side of the stairs, kind of just like high-fiving them and celebrating them and like petting them on the back and stuff, right? Now, I'm at the top of the stairs and they get about maybe a meter or two away from me and I have this thing where I'm, like you know when you're at the top of a really tall building and it's like a rooftop, right? And you look down the side and, and like the voice in your head kind of goes, I could jump, right? <laughs> like you don't want to, but you're like, I could jump, you know? I had that for, for something else, I stood there and I was like, I could kick him. <laughs> I could fuck this guy up right now. I could just be like, for my people, you know, like, And he's like, no. But I didn't do that, right? I didn't do that. Because I'm a professional. And I needed $100. <laughs> That's just a sad fact about that night. Eventually they reach the top of the stairs, right? And uh, I had to get the scroll out that I had, Jesus to unroll the scroll, and I had to read a list of this guy's fucking achievements out to everyone, right? And I can't remember what the achievements were, but for, you know, for the sake of the story, I ate a muesli bar, I don't know, fucking something. <laughs> and 
and I read it out loud. And after I read it out loud, everyone in the crowd started clapping, right? And as they were clapping, I was like, okay, now you have to punctuate this with a gesture, right? Because in the UK, if you get knighted, what happens? You take a sword, right? Your shoulders, bang, bang. So I was like, well, just, you know, you have a background in improv, just come up with a gesture. What's the gesture for you? So the, the, the gesture I came up with was I took my arm and I just placed it on both his shoulders like that. <laughs> and then I just gently booped his head. And then, <laughs> And I looked at Amanda, I was like, fuck. And then like me and Amanda went just scurrying back to the bathroom and we got changed, right? And that was the whole thing. The whole thing lasted maybe about three to four minutes, right? Now, even if that memory just lasted three to four minutes, that memory seared into my fucking brain forever, right? I think about that memory maybe like twice a month. <laughs> Because I reckon that image, right, that image of these two super, super wealthy old rich white people ascending up these stairs and having their friends celebrating them and high-fiving them for helping out a poor brown country, right? Meanwhile, two broke as fuck Southeast Asian actors are standing on top of the stairs who aren't even from that country and who are getting paid the same amount as one glass of these mingler champagne glasses. I reckon that image encapsulates everything wrong about the world. Honestly, everything. Think about it. Capitalism, racism, and shit. Amanda didn't have any lines, so sexism. <laughs> Just fucking say something! <laughs> the next day I get an email from my boss. Right? My boss goes, how did it go? And I said, look, thank you so much for the gig. I appreciate that you always have gigs for me and you have my back. But if I'm gonna be honest with you, it made me really uncomfortable. I'd really appreciate it if you didn't book me for gigs like this in the future. Cheers. Because I wanted to let her know how it made me feel, you know? And I think it was important to say something. Psych, I said cheers. Had heaps of fun doing it. Here's my invoice for the event. Cheers. I hit her with a cheers sandwich. <laughs> Because I was 22, man. I was 22, I didn't know how to stand up for myself, right? I'll tell you guys that story because stories like that made me realize that no matter how hard you tried to blend in, it was never gonna be enough for them. It was never gonna be enough. I experienced so many stories like that that if I'm gonna be honest with you all, I think it low-key radicalized me, right? It made me really fucking mad. And not in a productive way, not in a way that advances anything, just angry for the sake of it. You know, I became a guy who would just go on the internet and just say blanket statements like, man, fuck all white people, right? out of the guise of joking, but I low-key meant it, you know? But luckily, I met other people like Amanda who had similar experiences as me, right? And we, we came together and we used that anger and that energy and we channeled it into something positive. You know, we, we made work, we made art, we made stand-up, right? Theater, movies, we turned it into a good thing. Something else that happened to me in my 20s was uh, I started getting on TV for my comedy. Right? And because back then there was only like two Asian people on TV in New Zealand, like by default I became the representative. <laughs> you know what I mean? And now I have a love-hate relationship with being the representative, right? Because on one hand, if I can be the guy to inspire a young Filipino or Asian person to do what I do, I think that's fucking awesome. I'm very proud to be that, you know? Like if, if a young Filipino kid saw me on TV and went to his mom, I'm gonna be a comedian like James Rocker, right? And then his mom can be like, just because he's a disappointment doesn't mean you have to be like... <laughs> inspirational, you know? <laughs> but on the other hand, sometimes I fucking hate being the representative so much, because it's so tiring, it's exhausting, dude. Because often what will happen is some racist shit will happen to Asian people in the wild, and then my phone will light up, right? Because it's the news, or the morning shows, or the breakfast shows, or other current affairs shows, because they all want to invite me on their shows to ask me what I thought about what happened that day, right? And then I have to go on all these shows, and I have to be like, I cannot believe this has happened. <laughs> Racism in New Zealand? No way. <laughs> I hope it doesn't happen again, back to you. Like, <laughs> like, what do you want me to say? Yeah, of course, it's bad, please stop doing this. It's just the same thing over and over. To the point that I, I almost just wanna fuck with them. You know, just one time. One time I want some racist thing to happen and I want Hillary Barry, the nation's favorite journalist, to invite me on her show and I just want her to be like, so James, what do you think of what happened today? And I'll just be like, hmm, I'm into it. <laughs> bad enough if you ask me, like, because I'm tired, bro. I'm just repeating myself over and over. It's come to the point where, like, I'm, I'm on my phone, I see some racist shit happen to Asian people, and I almost just expect to look up and see a Batman signal in the sky, just two chopsticks in the clouds, just fucking... <laughs> And I have to put on my bat suit and be like, what is it? And they're like, it's David Seymour, he's at it again. And I'm like, not on my watch. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> it's exhausting shit, you know? I'll admit this, though. Even I see things to do with race that confuses me. I don't know how to process everything, right? 
I remember a couple months ago, I was at Auckland Airport at the Lost and Found, right? And I was lining up with my friend, and the guy serving everyone at the Lost and Found was this older white dude, old white gentleman, right? Serving everyone, and he was a nice guy. He was shaking everyone's hands, you know, big smile on his face. You could tell this guy was a nice guy. He was a good person. The woman in front of us in the line was an older Chinese lady, right? She had a big smile on her face, talking to everyone too, good vibes. You can tell, two good people, right? She walks up to the counter and starts speaking Chinese to this old white dude, right? Now, he wants to help her, but he doesn't quite know what to do. So he just kind of goes, um, sorry, you need to go and find someone who speaks Chinese, right? But she doesn't understand that, so she speaks even louder Chinese to this old white dude, and he gets flustered, and he goes, uh, sorry, you need to go and find someone who speaks Chinese. <laughs> And as soon as I saw that, my asshole went, ah! <laughs> Now, that's not even the wild part. That's not the wild part, right? Here's the wild part. So I watched her for her reaction, and I shit you not, she looked at him and went, oh, thank you, and then left. <laughs> like she understood what the fuck that meant. And when I saw that, that threw me for a loop. I was like, what the fuck? Yo, what the, was that good? Was that bad? I, I don't know. I, like, first of all, I'm amazed she understood what the fuck that meant, right? Because if you did that shit to me without saying anything, any context at all, I would get something completely different from that, you know? If you said that to me without saying anything, it would be, you need to go and find Cyclops from X-Men. <laughs> pew, 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 like that's what that is. <laughs> I turned to my friend, I was like, yo, did you see that shit? She's like, yeah. And I was like, was that good, was that bad? And she's like, yeah, of course it was bad. What are you talking about? I was like, yeah, I know it was bad, but I don't think he like meant anything by it. I think he just got flustered and he was trying to help her. And she goes, okay, well, if he was trying to help her, what he should have done then is she, he should have went, you need to go and find someone who speaks your language, right? And at first I was like, oh yeah, yeah, okay. No, that's the solution. No, I was wrong, you've got it, right? But then I thought about it and I was like, no, dude, you can't say that shit to a stranger without saying anything or context. To a stranger without saying anything, that means you need to go and find yourself. <laughs> Don't come back till you found it. Like that's <laughs> fucking terrifying, right? Eventually, me and my friend get to the front of the line. We get my friend's stuff get in the car, we drive home. Now, the whole ride home, I'm trying to unpack what I'd just seen, you know? I was like, man, what was that? You know, was that good, was that bad, what was it, you know? Eventually, I was like, okay, well then, how do I even know I saw the full picture? You know, what if I just saw a snippet of a much larger story? You know, like, what if, what if like two hours later, the Chinese woman came back with a blind lady with sunglasses on and went, huh, huh? <laughs> like, you know, like, <laughs> like plot twist, she's problematic, right? <laughs> and then I thought about it more, and I was like, okay, did she get hurt? I was like, no, I don't think so. She looked okay. Was he trying to hurt her? I don't think so either. Did I get hurt? Nope. Was he trying to hurt me? Nope. Okay, so no one got hurt. No one was trying to hurt anyone. Everyone was fine. And then the more I thought about it, the more I was like, okay, well, as people, aren't we just trying to connect with each other and try to find ways to connect and break barriers from people, right? And I went, these two managed to find a way to do it despite having a massive language barrier, right? So for like a weird split second moment in time, I felt weirdly warm and good about the story, which is such a weird place to land on after having such a tight asshole, just like moments <laughs> ago in such quick succession. That's like if you guys were walking down the street and some guy with a balaclava came up to you and was like, do you have any money? And you're like, no. And he's like, do you want some? <laughs> So tightening and a loosening of your butt very quickly. <laughs> but then I, eventually I snapped out of it. I was like, no, dude, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, sure, no one got hurt now, but that's just a happy coincidence. You know, people still do that shit and that shit every day to bully people and demean them, make them feel terrible and othered, right? So it's just best not to do that shit, right? And I learned that day that even if you're a good person with a pure heart, you can still do things that might hurt other people. So it's just best to learn what those things are so you don't do it. Right? That's what I learned. But I couldn't really focus on what I'd learned that day because I was too busy imagining a situation in China at the airport and an old Chinese guy serving an old white lady and he gets flustered and he just goes, <laughs> and she's like, thank you. <laughs> I think about that old white guy all the time. 
Not in a creepy way. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not in bed like, William, what are your dreams? <laughs> no, I think about him all the time because, you know, I wish I said something to him. I wish I actually talked to him because I feel like if I just explained what he did and why it could have been offensive, he might have listened. He might have learned something, you know? I also think about him because I reckon James in his 20s would have gone straight to Twitter and just ripped this guy a new asshole. He would have been like, man, fuck this old racist white guy at the airport. He must be a piece of shit. Fuck him, right? And I don't think it's fair to put him in the same basket as all the cars on the internet, you know? <laughs> I don't think they're the same guy, you know? And plus, I'm just tired of being the angry Asian dude and the, on the internet all the time. I am, you know, for multiple reasons. One, I went to therapy, and my therapist made me line up my values as a person, right? And I realized that all my values weren't lining up with how I was conducting myself in the world. You know, being this guy who just assumes the worst in others and assumes that everyone is by default a bad person. I don't want to be that guy, right? Something else that chilled me out is I turned 30. Uh, I'm actually 31 now, right? And something I've noticed about after turning 30 is I feel like I'm the most comfortable now more than I've ever been in my whole life, you know, ever. Like, uh, I remember uh, last year, I was at a small town cafe, and I was in the bathroom, and I was taking a shit. Right? Because, <laughs> you know, support local. Um, <laughs> it's been a hard two years, you know? So I'm in this bathroom, taking a big dump, right? And it was a, it was a bad one. Like, you know, like sometimes, you know, sometimes when you smell your own poo, you're like, that's not so bad. This was not bad. <laughs> like, I was sitting there, I was like, there's a demon in your body. Like, it's bad. <laughs> and like, I was there for a while. I was there for a while, right? Like, if I had to estimate how long I was there for, I'd say I was there for around maybe 15 to 20 TikTok videos. Um, <laughs> Like watching them, not making them. <laughs> like I wasn't in the toilet like, in a minute, I'm gonna need a sentimental man or woman to wipe my ass. No, not like that. Eventually I finish, right? I finish, clean up, wash my hands, and go outside. Now, as soon as I open the door, I see there's a young girl waiting to use the bathroom because it's the only bathroom in the whole building, right? And she sees me and her eyes light up. Right? And she's like, oh, James. Oh man, I love you on The Masked Singer, right? Because if you didn't know, I was lucky enough to be one of the guessing judging panelists on our version of The Masked Singer, right? Which is a show that I love doing, and the critics agreed, definitely happened. <laughs> they loved it, right? She's like, man, I love you on The Masked Singer. You know, me and my friends, we're all like young theater Asian kids from this town, and we all look up to you, man. We, it's so nice to see more Asian people on TV. Keep up the good work, right? <laughs> And when I heard that, I was like, man, that's so nice. What a nice thing to say to someone, you know? And like, I went, okay, maybe all those times when I feel like it's exhausting to be the representative, maybe it's worth it when you have moments like this and you can inspire young people like this. Maybe this is all what it's for. Maybe this is why I need to keep going. And it felt really good, right? It made me feel really nice. And so I just said, man, thank you so much. I, I genuinely needed to hear that today. Thank you. And as I said that, the smell from my monstrous shit <laughs> just came spilling out of the room behind me, as if to say, did someone say Asian representation? <laughs> right? And the cloud just like engulfed both of us. Like, and like, I knew she smelt it. You know, like, I knew. Like, I don't know if anyone in this room has ever watched someone stop being a fan of them in real time. <laughs> but it's instant, bro. It's fine. Like, her face went from, <laughs> like, it just melted away. <laughs> So I'm standing there and I'm like, oh, and we're just like standing in a swirling shit. This green cloud look like fuck it, like a cartoon, just bad, you know? Right now, here's how I know I'm the most comfortable now, more than I've ever been in my whole life. Because I reckon younger James would have reacted differently in the situation. I reckon 20-year-old James would have tried to lie to get out of the situation. You know, I reckon 20-year-old James would have been like, P you, <laughs> who was in there before I did my 20-minute piss? Like <laughs> That's not gonna work, but he'll give it a go, you know? <laughs> I reckon 25-year-old James would've tried to make a joke out of the situation, you know? I reckon 25-year-old James would've been like, it's ironic you're a big fan, because it's exactly what we need right now. <laughs> but 30-year-old James didn't do that shit, baby. Here's what 30-year-old James did. 30-year-old James planted both of his feet, made direct eye contact with her, and went, enjoy. <laughs> Enjoy the mass singer, like, because I don't care anymore, you know, I'm 30 and that's my shit, enjoy it, right? I don't give a shit. 
That actually brings me back to the question I had at the start of the show, which is, is it time to retire the name Badon? Right? Is it time? And I think if you asked me this question before I started working on the show, I would have just said, yes, of course, retire it. I don't care. But the more I reflected on my life, the more I realized I don't think it's that simple. Because like I said, I'm the most comfortable now more than I've ever been in my whole life. But not just about my body, right? But about everything, my culture, my identity, my ethnicity, all of that, right? And I, and I don't think I'd be here if I didn't go through that journey that all the migrants go through, you know, of like coming to a country, feeling the pressure that you need to fit in, but then later on meeting your people that allow you to be proud of who you are and reclaim yourself, you know, and coming out the other side. And I've realized that how I feel about this name Badong directly mirrors that journey, right? Because now at 31, whenever I think of Badong, it reminds me of home. You know, it reminds me of my siblings. It reminds me of my dad cooking my favorite Filipino food for me. You know, adobo, shavshado, leche flan. It reminds me of my mom blessing the food before we eat, you know. It reminds me of my parents asking me why I don't have kids yet. <laughs> Just warm things. I also realized that that little kid who moved to New Zealand at the age of eight, that wasn't James, that was Badong, right? And I think to retire this name feels weirdly disrespectful to this kid, you know, because he's, he's Badong, like he went through all of that so I could be who I am today. He went through all of that so I could stand here on the stage and tell you about that shit I did in that small town toilet. <laughs> so is it time to retire the name Badong? Nah, man, I don't think so. I think if, if anything, it's time to double down on this shit, right? So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get all my workmates to call me Badong. I'm gonna get my nieces and nephews to call me Tito Badong. I'm gonna get my grandkids to call me Lolo Badong. I'm gonna get my white friends to call me James. I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. If you wanna call me Badong, please call me Badong, because I've learned now that if you have something that makes you stand out like this, fucking own that shit, right? Own it, because that's exactly who you should be. Why would you hide who you actually are from anyone? Fuck that, dude, live your life. And I think it's just best to just like celebrate each other's differences and, and coexist, right? That's, that's the best way to do it. And when, when I realized that, that made me feel lighter, you know? I felt freer. But then I also went, I wish there was more. Like, I wish there was a gesture that I could make to really show everyone that I was gonna own this name moving forward. You know, like, I wish, I, I wish there was like a place I could go to where I could ask professionals for advice on how to find that gesture to show everyone that I love this name now. And I thought about it, and I found a place. What you have is a malformation of your identity. It's caused by a psychological condition known as a simulus caucasus. <laughs> it happens pag na prepare ka sa school to fit in, tapos nahihiya ka sa pangalan mo. Doc, gano'n po ba katagal yung operasyon? There will be a series of operations. Bawat mga operasyon, matatapos ng isang buong araw, after one week, aalisin, mayroon ka ng bagong buhay. Bakit he looks the same? Oh, we didn't operate on his face. Bakit naka bandage? For dramatic effect. Eh, then what did you operate on? This. Badong. Guapo ka na? Oo nga, kuya. Hindi ka na mukhang tae.
that I'm the kid on the rise Line me up, start the session with a spark of the fire Organize, mobilize, we the kids with the plan Don't need to pull up with the shoddy just to ask who I am Pure blood, mixed mind, colonized from birth Assimilated, immigrated, but our soul still hurt A hundred generations later, what have we become? Make the world a better place, teach our daughters and sons Make the room go silent when we speak in tongues They wanna make it to the top, I'd rather be in love But still, I will overcome Always living by this bottle, breathe the air from my lungs and say hey.